What I love about the Eurasian Media Forum is that it breaks a lot of boundaries in making sure that everyone talks straight and is very clear in their message and so on. And it always reminds me of a story that the former British Prime Minister John Major tells of his trip to Moscow when uh, Boris Yeltsin was president. And he tells a story, he said, I was walking through the, the Kremlin with President Yeltsin and looking at the, this, this place of power, a lot of power in Russia. And he said, I thought I have to ask President Yeltsin a tough question. I thought, what can I ask him as a tough question? So I said, President Yeltsin, if you could describe the economy of Russia in one word, what would you say? And Yeltsin said, good. And John Major said, I, th I thought, how can he say that? It's, it's not, it's falling apart in here. All right, President Yeltsin, he said, if you could use more than one word, what would you say? And Yeltsin said, not good. So we make sure our, our uh, panelists give us straight answers here, as you know. And for that, I bring us to the third panel session, which explores the secret of the Asian economic miracle and how the Asian tiger economies seem to have achieved so much success in a relatively short time. The moderator of this uh, session is a very dear friend of mine, so please give a very warm welcome to the Global Director at Bloomberg Media. He's coming from the UK, Mr. Todd Baer. Thanks very much, Riz. And a special thanks to Her Excellency Dr. Dariga Nazarbayeva. Thank you for the invitation to moderate this uh, very important panel. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, over the next 90 minutes, we will be speaking, debating, and analyzing the secret of the Asian economic miracle. As many of you well know, there's a lot of turbulence in the global economy, which is putting significant strain on many leading countries. But against this backdrop, a number of economies in Asia have achieved tremendous success in a very short period of time. Specifically, the Asian tigers, the highly developed economies of Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and of course, followed by China. We are going to talk about the driving forces behind this economic miracle. We'll talk about challenges, sustainability, what is really happening versus what appears to be happening. We will shine light on government and the private sector and explore who the Asian tigers of the future may be. We have four excellent speakers on the panel today, starting with His Excellency, Mr. Kairat Kelambetov, the governor of the Astana International Financial Center. He is a former deputy prime minister and central bank governor here in Kazakhstan and a graduate of Georgetown University. Governor Kellen Beitov, welcome to the panel. Thank you for your time. Next up, we welcome Mr. Parag Hanna, an economist and senior fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew University in Singapore. He is a best-selling author of several books, including one of my favorites, Connectography, and he is a CNN global contributor. Mr. Hanna, welcome to the panel and thank you for your time. Next up, we have Aryuna Namsrai, the Managing Director of Eurasia at APCO Worldwide, a global public affairs and strategic communications consultancy. Ms. Namsrai advises governments in Eurasia and Western companies doing business in the region. She is originally from Mongolia, a country I know better than most. Ms. Nabsfry, welcome to the panel and thank you for your time. And finally, Mr. Wang Wei, the chairman of China Mergers and Acquisitions Association. Mr. Wang has extensive experience in corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, and public offerings. He has a PhD from Fordham University in New York. Mr. Wei, welcome to the panel and thank you for your time. Okay, so we're going to kick things off with each panelist getting four minutes for opening remarks on the Asian economic miracle, starting with His Excellency, Mr. Kairat Kelambetov. Governor, go ahead. I think uh, 
first of all, we've been all in, uh, very much, uh, very much admired of the economic growth which happened uh, in Southeast Asia, and definitely for Kazakhstan, some of the countries have uh, been uh, chosen like a benchmark. Uh, and uh, so let me more talk about uh, South Korea and Singapore, and so maybe my colleagues uh, add more about the other uh, peers. Uh, but I think especially Singapore is a kind of a great model uh, for Kazakhstan. And uh, what is a kind of, to my mind, is a key, a key ingredients of a success uh, is kind of, to my mind, three, uh, four, uh, three, uh, three four uh, very important issues. So, so the number one is institution. So we know from all the uh, researches, uh, and I think that there was a lot of books about the miracles uh, in, uh, among uh, Asian targets, uh, tigers, that uh, the most important stuff is institution. So I, I believe that uh, the book of him uh, uh, Mr. Ajomoglu about why the nations fails uh, or why the, some nations became uh, more richer, uh, exactly about this stuff. So what was uh, kind of the ingredients of the key success in Singapore that uh, the British institutions actually uh, give the, a lot of opportunities for the country really kind of uh, to bring uh, the future success in, in economic reforms, which is uh, I think the most important is the rule of law. I think that rule of law is actually the, exactly the point which is attract the uh, many investors and uh, so and also allow to the local uh, community really kind of to believe to the, the future of the country. So this is number one. Number two is a, a leadership role. I, th I, I believe that the role of the political leaders in South Korea and in Singapore is really important stuff, especially the, I think that Lee Kuan Yew story is exactly, uh, it's kind of great point that the, the nations believe that the, uh, the uh, leader's role is really kind of the uh, very uh, substantial. And number, uh, and number three is a kind of a long-term vision and strategy. Uh, the all this country, I think that uh, kind of created, first of all, the long-term vision in terms of the like a 20 years horizon vision and strategy, what to do, what kind of the, uh, industrial policy should be, what kind of the uh, uh, policy to bring investment, uh, what kind of uh, reform should be done in this country. Uh, so this is like a key uh, particular ingredient. And uh, also, I think that the role of the sovereign wealth funds, not just like only the funds which invest or kind of to bring money to the country, but also kind of institutional role, which for example, play TMASIC and, and GAC, and also the, the uh, also the institutions, which is kind of the, the pension fund of the Singapore, is actually exactly divided the uh, institutions in Singapore. So the GIC was responsible to invest outside, but it's also kind of create pool of money, uh, which is kind of give the opportunity to Singapore to bring the global asset management community. The TMASIC was uh, uh, also play the significant role on the early stage in industrial policy but uh, later on in terms of the kind of the regional dimension. I think Singapore plays a significant role like a part of the ASEAN. And also the pension uh, savings of the people of Singapore also allow uh, to, to Singapore to use this money from one side, but also to deliver it the pension savings to, to the people. So these are kind of the key ingredients. I think that's very important lesson to us. I think that we have a lot of similarities and later on I can kind of more liberate in terms of how we're going to use it in Kazakhstan. Thank you, Paraghana, opening remarks on the Asian economic miracle. Sure. Thanks so much, Todd, and, uh, and thanks to all of you for being here. I also want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Nazareva for her patronage and leadership of this initiative. I have been coming to Kazakhstan for almost 20 years, and uh, you know to see the evolution of the country as a whole, of Astana, for sure, to be hosting the expo, this is all um, really a good example of uh, a new economic renaissance. You could call it another economic miracle that's, uh, that's taking place here, and uh, I think it's worth pointing out that because the chairman has just spoken, you, you are actually uh, this country's version of the visionaries that you've just described in the East Asian context, so I'm honored to be sharing the stage with you and, and our other panelists. So let me, um, let me give um, a, a, a picture that includes China as well into the equation, because it, the Asian economic miracle ha really has a very specific timeline and a set of changes that took place 
that helped that region become the power, the central power that it is today. Uh, 25 years ago, Asia did not represent one third of world GDP the way it does right now. And there is a very specific roadmap that actually goes back to the early 19th century. The playbook that Asia followed is the one that actually America did in the early 19th century, and it's one that we should always keep in mind because it works. The first is opening up to foreign investment and production, right? The, um, the ways in which uh, uh, Japan rose into the global value chains, and then certainly Shenzhen uh, in China in 1979 with the establishment of special economic zones, attracted foreign investment, brought in foreign capital, foreign technology, uh, hiring and training local workers, and that is how China became the world's factory floor. And in doing so, China built up very large trade surpluses, very large currency reserves, and then it didn't squander them, right? It invested them. It invested them in modernization, invested them in infrastructure, and simultaneously, you've had urbanization to absorb what was a very large, young, working age cohort of the Chinese population. So there are other parts of Asia. Now we look at East Asia and we see that it's aging. We see that Korea, Japan, China have very high dependency ratios. Meanwhile, a very large swath of Asia, please remember this, Asia is almost 5 billion people. China is only 1.4 billion people. So often when we talk about Asia, we mean just China. But that's obviously not the case. So let's talk about the other three plus billion people who live in countries that are not aging, that are young, that still have an opportunity to uh, get hitched to global value chains, to attract investment, to urbanize, to create jobs for their youth, to invest in infrastructure. There is a long way to go before three billion people in Asia have followed that playbook that has succeeded in East Asia, and they must do it. They must do it in the next five to 10 years because now we're in an environment where oil prices are structurally low. And this is another example of where we can look to East Asia because we have, to, if you substitute commodities with manufacturing, you would look at the East Asian story and you would say, you would say, Todd, why are we even talking about this East Asian miracle? It's running out of steam. Export-led growth is over. Manufacturing is going to be displaced by robots. Those countries are never going to get past the middle income trap, right? So whether the problem is commodities or the problem is manufacturing, the key lesson to look at now is the transition to services, right? The extent to which you've invested in the social sector, in education, in health care, in infrastructure, in non-tradable services, which are higher wage areas, so that your next generation is not caught in the middle income trap, is not caught in the low commodities trap, is not caught in the automation trap. And that's where we have to think about the strategies for the next five to 10 years. I know we're gonna come back to this uh, moving forward. I think those are some of the key lessons, not just from Asia's past, but from some of the countries in Asia today that are rapidly investing in digital, in services, in e-commerce, in logistics, in healthcare, in education, because those are non-tradable services and it's helping those countries stay resilient and keep growing in the face of deceleration of trade, automation, and low commodities prices. Thank you very much. Ariana Namsrai of APCO Worldwide, your opening remarks on the Asian economic miracle. Thank you, Todd. As um, Todd mentioned, I'm originally from Mongolia. I lived in Russia, Washington, New York, and now I'm living in London. So my perspective is different than uh, my uh, fellow panelists who've been living, breathing, eating with economics and data and markets. Um, as we know that the uh, Asian economic miracle led by Japan, and like we mentioned, followed by, in 70s and 80s, so <coughs> Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. But the Chinese growth has been unprecedented compared to all those Asian countries. We've been talking about Southeast Asian miracle for so many years, but overall it's all Asia when we're looking at it from this perspective. And Asia became a manufacturing powerhouse as a transition. I think that's the one of the miracles because trans uh, a transition from the low a productivity like labor from agriculture countryside into the you know basic manufacturing or light manufacturing or expert you know oriented manufacturing that led into the you know value chain up with a higher salary improved labor and uh, um, improved living standards but that created also needed an export uh, market which is the model and I think the trade 
was another um, ingredient for Asian countries to develop the economy because it kind of um, was an energy and boost to the economy. So Asia becoming manufacturing powerhouse and then doing the trade because of the traditional history or background, they also uh, moved into the consumer market. So they need to shape the consumer market. And um, China has been very successful in Japan, as you know, um, you know, replicating what advanced economies already have done in the, in the, but the, you know, the services and products have been cheaper. But there will be a point where, I mean, we're gonna talk about the challenges maybe a little bit later, but there will be a point like we're seeing in Japan that innovation has to replace the, all the copying replicated. So I think, uh, um, you know, there are miracles, but then uh, whether it's sustainable, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about it later. Thank you. Absolutely, we will be talking about uh, sustainability and uh, what is really happening uh, versus what appears uh, to be happening. That brings us to our uh, other guest, Mr. Wang Wei. Uh, your opening remarks on the Asian economic miracle. That's right, okay. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. I actually, I heard uh, three panelists, they are very powerful, uh, different perspectives. And uh, I think I'm, businessman, I'm doing a small firm of uh, 30 years for M&A, and stations, and also have people listing. So I'm not from economist view or government view, but since a personal experience, uh, I agree with the lady, uh, China's miracle is so much different from so-called Asian America. There's a lot of way. Generally, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, those tigers, they just join global economy, use the market economy. This is part of American pathway, just follow that way. But China is different. And for, the, uh, for all those years, for the 20 years, past 20, probably 30 years, China growth has always been criticized by the Western. We are wrong this way, that way, dictatorship, but not democratic, not so much market driven. Lots always have been so called China Beijing. But all of a sudden, China had to be, become the miracle. So this is so much different. Uh, it's uh, something, uh, something going there. So I would think uh, China right now, uh, just recently they mentioned one bell, one route. This is called a bell route initiative in the Davos, Mr. President Xi Jinping, they mentioned that. This also so much different from history. They had tried to find China's own way. We don't know at this moment what's going on. The China's global way, expansion, uh, the, uh, the land up with those undeveloped country. Not sophisticated market economy, the so-called uh, the one by one route circle has been next future generation for China. So I think there's still a lot of spectators, both China and outside, in what China going to do at this moment. You, yes, everybody thought China's booming economy, we, we owe a lot from openness, WTO, and reform. But like we think China Muscle is strong, but the mind still pretty preliminary at this moment. Even in China, not China Beijing, even China business, we still think what if even China right now so powerful look like, but how we can provide for the world economy. The so-called global economy, a globalization, what China's role in the future. So that's why the new generation Chinese entrepreneur is so much different from old generation. They are so much familiar with the internet, e-commerce, environmental things, powerful things. So what I'd say, at this moment, there's different generation of Chinese entrepreneur in startup country. They have different mentality. So we'll, we'll probably we'll get back to later. So I would generally say China, yes, is booming. Business, economy but not so much sophisticated in the whole mechanism. It's still dangerous. So that's why uh, we are very uh, 
keen to know how the world reacts to China's one-by-one -one route policy and how the Chinese businessmen melt smoothly with right now the world system and maybe working together to create a new scenario. So that's a lot of challenges for China right now. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I do want to come back to yeah. uh, what is happening in China, and I, I want to consider you, consider you an insider on that because <laughs> most of us are outsiders. Uh, Governor Kalambaitov, you were recently uh, on international television talking about Kazakhstan becoming the Singapore of Central Asia. I was in East Africa last year uh, talking with the leaders there, about President Kagame and his finance minister, talking about Rwanda becoming the Singapore of Africa. Why among the Asian tigers does everyone want to be Singapore uh, as opposed to South Korea or Taiwan or Hong Kong? <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, very important to emphasize that the Singapore uh, role is like to be a regional business hub. For, uh, I think Kazakhstan for, or especially, uh, and in Kazakhstan, Astana is like a uh, natural uh, business hub for the region which we call traditionally Central Asia. In broader terms, Central Asia is not just the five countries, uh, uh, post-Soviet Union countries, but also part of the Caucasus country, Mongolia, or maybe uh, also the uh, kind of uh, western part of China or south, uh, southern part of Russia. So it's kind of a big region which is about 200 million people, and for us, it is important that uh, how Singapore uses their kind of a geographic location in order to be regional hub, even being like a small city with a very small population. Uh, the, uh, I think for Kazakhstan, it's very much important. So, what is kind of the key ingredients of the success? And it was like a leadership, and we have, uh, we also have here the leadership of President Nazarbayev. We have a long-term vision. We have a, uh, let's say economic policy focus on the kind of uh, also to take advantage of the modernization of the post industrial revolution which is happening now and i think that in this terms the kazakhstan is more using like uh, which mr uh, parahana mentioned like a strategy focus on be like a service economy to china uh, to central asia to our neighborhood uh, in eurasian economic union uh, and i think that in this terms uh, Singapore is more close to us rather than other uh, countries who more focus on the tech development. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Add on to that. Um, you know, the story of Singapore is not just rule of law and, and political stability and so forth, but actually it's, it's uh, economic diversification and regulatory arbitrage, two very, very important things for all of us to keep in mind. The diversification is incredible, actually. People don't expect that a tiny, tiny island with five million people would have such a diversified economy, but in fact it does. Financial services, it's a major shipping and logistics hub, uh, um, uh, energy, uh, oil and gas refinery, and so on and so forth. So extremely diversified uh, economy, and that's obviously a good role model for many countries to follow. And then there's regulatory arbitrage. You have a sub-region of ASEAN, which has nearly 700 million people. 75% of the foreign investment that goes into ASEAN is channeled through Singapore through tiny, tiny Singapore. So here in Kazakhstan, you have a, a very large catchment area. We were speaking just earlier about this. There is no major financial center between, say, you know, Moscow, Dubai, um, you know, uh, Europe and, and Beijing on the other side, right? So in this whole area, there is a need to have uh, and to take advantage of the fact that this country wants to upgrade its regulations and be that filter for regional and global capital. And I think those are also part of the Singapore model. Ariana, go ahead. You know, I worked at the United Nations in New York and I remember um, the delegation um, that were, you know, United Nations tasked the delegation in 1960 right after um, Britain granted independence and after the crisis. So they were saying, delegation, part of the delegation were meeting and they, when we went there, we looked around and said, poor little country in a dark Asian corner, how could this country, city state would survive? And then 60 years later, this country is the second largest 
the GDP per capita, and the second most entrepreneurs per capita, right, only after US. So what is the miracle, what is the success story? And in addition to what you mentioned, I think also they had you know, hands-off approach in terms of regulations, but hands-on approach in terms of foreign companies. They didn't reject foreign capital. They, on the contrary, they helped with the export, you know, tariffs and taxes, concessions, and they invited export foreign companies, and they brought with them foreign capital skills, uh, technology. And I think that was the Singaporean model. And here, Kazakhstan, we say also Kazakhstani model. So each and every country has its own model, and that's, I think, the foreign companies um, and entrepreneurship boosted the um, economy of this country. Mr. Wong, it is not going to be that easy for these countries, these cities, to just become Singapore. Describe the challenges they will face. I mean, it's a pretty lofty ambition for cities like Kigali and Astana yes. and a lot of other places. Yes. Uh, a lot of people feel a misunderstanding by China. It's like China booming because the economy uh, marketized. A lot of people generally say that. Actually, from my experience, China booming has strong power from government. China still homogeneously uh, is a homogeneous society. Government control everything. But in the last 20 years, there is 29 or 28 local government competing each other. They use their power. So you can say like a market economy, like a competing each other, the press, uh, incentive, uh, a lot of prop, uh, property rights reform, but behind is local government power. So that's one factor why Chinese government, uh, China government, uh, Chinese government uh, economic booming. The uh, whole world know China booming literally from 2008. That year, because global financial crisis, Americans go down, Europe in trouble, and then everybody look up China. And China has strong government stimulation, full a trillion RMB invested, and China goes through that way. So that's why there's a lot of controversy in China right now. Is there central planning is power in the future? Especially those uh, couple of years people talk about the big data, the big data economy, if your government have power supporting by the big data analysis, know every detail, is there the invisible hand will be, it won't work? The government will have more power? This is right now uh, still uh, in China's uh, issue of controversy. So that's uh, some, uh, just give an idea. Again, I'm not an economist, but there's a lot of entrepreneurs in China, is, they rely on government stimulation at this moment, yeah. We have a saying in the news business that all yes. news is local. So I think what you're saying is all growth in China is local at the city level with yes. mayors and city yes. councils. Yes. A governor, how are you going to make this happen uh, to become the Singapore of Central Asia? Take me through the first couple of steps. Give me a timeline on, on how this happens. I think you're partially the way there, aren't you? So I think we, in, here in Kazakhstan, uh, we driven by the best practice globally is not only Singapore, but is also the other uh, peers, uh, which we would like is just to, to bring the best models, whatever is like uh, industrial policy or, or uh, kind of the rule of law or any other dimension. So I think that uh, the key uh, conceptual papers was uh, issued by the President Nazarbayev is uh, about uh, 100 uh, steps to uh, 100 concrete steps towards uh, the uh, institution, five institutional reforms. And among these institutional reforms is number one is rule of law, uh, the good quality of the civil service and privatization, which we realize, uh, especially after the recent uh, collapse of the price of commodities, and you know that the Kazakhstan is more well known like a oil rich country, that uh, we realize that it's really kind of the uh, was a very uh, good wake-up call for us. So we should really focus, which we, uh, um, Mr. Hanna mentioned, is on diversification of our economy uh, in terms of the not depend uh, to the, let's say, any kind of uh, commodities. 
is not because of the kind of the drop of the oil price, but because the, it's a change of uh, entire paradigm in terms of the global economy, uh, switch from the uh, hydrocarbon uh, to more to uh, sus more sustainable way of our development. And I think here in Kazakhstan we kind of choose, uh, and we have a very good opportunities really kind of to leapfrog to the new destination. Uh, using our geographic location. Again, so we are part of the One Belt, One Road initiatives. So we uh, landlock from one side, but from the other side, we have access to the ocean of opportunities in terms of the future economic growth in Asia. And you know that the economic gravity, global economic gravity is now moving from Europe to the, towards uh, Asia. And we have a big market, so it's not only China, it's India, uh, it's uh, other countries. And so what we want is just to be really kind of the uh, the gateway to the, uh, uh, to the uh, west uh, of uh, China, to connect really China and uh, the Eastern Europe. And not just to be like a transit country, but also to use these kind of flows of goods and services and to provide it to the uh, kind of demand of these countries. You can imagine like in China very soon we will get the situation where uh, 300 million people would be middle class. And all of these people want to travel, they want to get the new touristic destinations, they want to get a very good uh, quality of food. And I think the Kazakhstan, through the uh, own touristic program, uh, the food processing, agriculture industries, and also commodities, but also the other types and kind of the, the regional hub in terms of the financial services and other type of the services, be kind of to play this role. We have a program, we have a delivery units of all of these programs. One of the delivery units is a team of the Astana International Financial Services. In terms of the time horizon, I think that, uh, so we have a strategy up to the 2050. In our um, strategy in AAFC, I think in next 15, 20 years, we want to be in top uh, 15 uh, Asian financial uh, hubs. And Parag, what do you say to people who think that this calling it a miracle is 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 over the top that there's, there's no such thing that it's not sustainable what do you say to the doubters for this this region yes um you know i i don't pay any attention to it quite frankly because whenever people focus on the downside story they're actually missing some of the big structural positive uh aspects of what's going on so let me give you an example What's forgotten when we look at just the economies of this region and we focus so much on, you know, one belt, one road and so forth, which is very, very, very important and I'm, and I'm a big supporter of it. We forget the role, the interest that Europe has in all of this. It's all about bringing together the, the liquidity, the enormous market that Europe is with Asia. So let me give you some, some data here. Trade between the European Union and uh, South Korea, China, Japan, Australia, India, ASEAN, so the sub-regions of Asia. Trade between Europe and Asia is larger than trade between Europe and America. Now, we have all grown up in a late 20th, early 20th, 21st century era when the transatlantic, the US-EU trade relationship was the foundation of the world economy, and the foundation of free trade, right? That's only $1.1 trillion per year. Whereas trade between Europe and Asia now is already $1.3, $1.4 trillion a year. Now what's missing from this? The US and the EU have free trade. Europe and Asia do not. So you have $1.4 trillion of trade, even though it's not even free trade. Europe only has one, the EU only has one free trade agreement in Asia, and that's with South Korea, one of the smallest of that bigger Asian picture. Second thing, what's missing? The infrastructure, right? The connectivity that will make it that much easier for Europe and Asia to trade with each other. So give me a naysayer and then look at reality. The reality is that when we reconvene in 10 years and gather right here in Astana, you could be talking about 2.5 to $3 trillion of trade easily between Europe and Asia. From the, from the point that we are at right now. We're at 50% of that point right now. But this is very, very fast growing. And who will capture those benefits? I have no doubt that the countries in this region will capture a lot of the benefits. Aryuna, I want to go over to South Korea, one of the tigers. Uh, 
which has stumbled in recent times. Um, with the uh, ousting of President Park, the scandal at Samsung. South Korea was a, a darling of uh, the international uh, press, at least. Uh, um, a growing economy, great car companies, everything's working, they're in a difficult neighborhood. How are they going to put things back, back together? I think, think, I think in addition to what's going on in the political sphere and what you just mentioned, um, I think that South Korea reached the point that Japan reached in terms of multinationals and companies, those big troubles. So if you're not creating an environment for innovation and creativity or diversity or modernization, you reach the point that kind of stagnation, where is the brand, where are the multinationals? I think the next stage for Asia development, including South Korea, is uh, you know, whether their basic structural organization of financial thing would meet what's going on right now, whether it's a fourth industrial revolution or artificial intelligence or all this what's going on with the uh, um, internet um, uh, development. But, uh, you know, going, just following up on this, right now trade is going south-south, more so north-south. And with what we're talking about, you know, One Belt, One Road or New Silk Road, it's going to unlock 70% of the population, you know, 40 countries from Kazakhstan and Iran and the whole thing. So that's, that's a boost for the region and including uh, South Korea because trade is right at the corner. But if you compare with the China, if you look at it, China, Chinese trade partners, they have twice as much as the United States of America in terms of the trade partners. This is as of last um, last year's World Bank. Uh, so it shows how, so I think in that sense, I would say people are not so optimistic in terms of Asian growth, including South Korea. I think I would say, you know, this um, new Silk Road, the new trade, uh, one belt, one road, they would, you know, boost the economy. As what well about sustainability, Mr. Wong? Uh, a lot of people say it, you can't continue uh, the economic growth cannot continue at this rate. Uh, the, there are too many uh, challenges in the world, whether it's uh, geography or politics or terrorism. Yeah. Uh, how, I want you to talk about how these economies are going to continue to grow. Uh, well, there's two ways. One, to talk about the one by one rule, the Chinese strategy right now. And there is a, a seven, so called 70 country has been. Uh, not so much sophisticated market uh, economy. So there's a lot of country risk involved, certainly. So that's uh, something uh, just like uh, people very cautious about this one. Uh, even globally, very ch everybody, a uh, lot of country chanting. Uh, last two months ago, probably 30 countries present come to Beijing to chanting this one. But in China business, uh, business community, uh, we are optimistic future, but recent couple of years still uh, hesitating and still a little bit of spectacle at this moment. But generally, Chinese uh, economy, we still feel very uh, optimistic about it because uh, most Chinese dominant uh, mainstream entrepreneur is from so-called post 80s, the burn after 1980s. This young, they are new generation from internet educated, and a lot of e-commerce has been so popular in China, like a Jack Ma, uh, Ma Hua Teng, I mean, the top three Chinese internet company has been top 10 in the world. And the young, uh, the most Chinese consumer accepted internet is more advantage than United States anywhere in the world. So this is, a lot like talk about the AI, uh, artificial intelligence, even blockchain, everybody talk about it. The startup spirit in China everywhere. So for the young generation, they are very energetic. They trust the future. They talk about uh, one by one route, their internet. So uh, that's the, the spirit in China still very, very uh, strong at this moment. So we are, uh, in, we are for myself, so we are doing a lot of m and right now. In the t last 10 years, we do China domestic m and but right now, every month, we had so many out, I mean, driving offers to the United States, to South Africa, Latin American, everywhere. 
just people just buy. So this is something uh, I think is uh, still uh, positive. Thank you. And for Governor and for Parag, you know, look, a lot of people predicted that uh, the Asian subcontinent is where World, World War III would break out. And now we're talking about uh, an economic miracle. How is uh, this part of the world going to avoid conflict? First with the governor. I think recently was a very important event. Uh, in the first day of the opening expo, it was at the same time the, uh, the political summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And you know that this uh, year, this meeting, uh, this meeting was very important that the India and Pakistan joined to the High Cooperation Organization. So before it was like uh, uh, five, six members, including Kazakhstan, Russia, China, other Central Asian countries. Uh, and the first purposes of this uh, organization was actually the peaceful agreement in terms of the, any kind of the border issues which was not done during the Soviet Union time. And it was a further development of this organization in terms of the political dialogue. So I believe that the Kazakhstan actually was always uh, focused on the more political uh, re relationship in order to avoid any kind of the conflicts. So it was the, also the initiative of Kazakhstan to, to have a kind of a conference about the uh, dialogue between all the Asian countries, uh, exactly what was done in Europe in previous uh, 50 years. So, and I think the joining of this uh, kind of the political giant uh, in Asia, like uh, India and Pakistan, is very much important. So all these countries has now the platform to talk. And I believe that uh, this is a very good uh, first step in order to get the full common understanding about the further uh, peaceful development of this region. Bill, there are a lot of weapons in the neighborhood. I want to give uh, Paraghana a chance to touch on conflict, and then we're going to turn to our audience uh, for uh, some questions mm -hmm. and answers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Parag, sure. on conflict. You're absolutely right that the since the end of the Cold War, really, most of the major conflict scenarios have been in Asia, whether it's India, Pakistan, China, Taiwan, China, Japan, South China Sea, so on and so forth. But we've had 25 years in which none of those major conflict scenarios has escalated to the point where they have derailed this broader growth and integration story. Because during that same period of time, not only have these conflicts not reached the point of no return, but these economies have actually grown closer uh, together. And that's very, very important. So clearly, governments have reached a degree of maturity in which bilaterally they can separate the political tensions from the economic cooperation. While they have been doing that bilaterally, they've also been building some of these regional cooperative mechanisms, ASEAN Regional Forum, East Asian Community, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and so forth. If we can have this multilateralism in Asia actually strengthen to not just be you know, superficial, but to really have uh, to, to, to strengthen the restraining power that it has, that will be very, very promising. And that will help us to have more confidence that Asia is going to overcome, not just forestall inevitable conflict, because the model that we apply to Asia from the Western mindset tends to be, well, you're doing a good job of forestalling conflict for now, but it is going to happen, right? What you have to do is to move to the next phase psychologically. We're saying, actually, it's more likely than not that there will not be conflict. And I hope that that's the direction we're moving in with all of these new institutions. Hopefully not. Uh, let's now turn to our audience for some questions. Anybody with a question out there? Congressman? Please go ahead and stand up, uh, state your name, and, and go ahead with your question. Uh, name is Don Bonker. And I noticed there was no reference to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. Uh, Robert Zellick, who was once the head of the World, uh, uh, World Bank, World Bank, 
was also the trade representative and negotiated multiple trade agreements. And he once said that these agreements were more about politics than economics. And indeed, what motivated the Obama administration to engage the Southeast Asians in a trade agreement was more geopolitical, to provide some kind of protection from China's growing influence in the region. And this would be mutually beneficial to the Asian countries like Indonesia and Thailand, as well as the US. It got into our presidential campaign. And as we know, it was not only demonized by the Trump campaign, but Bernie Sanders, the far left Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, who once supported it, backed away, and there was not a single candidate, Democrat or Republican, who supported or defended the TPP. Now that it has been put into the garbage dump and no longer exists, that whole motive of protecting these countries from China's influence has been removed. So what is the result here? What once was going to be an alignment that was mutually beneficial no longer exists. Is this an open opportunity now for China to exercise its influence in that area to a way that's not going to be beneficial to the U.S. or to the countries involved? Or will these Asian countries attempt to have an agreement with China or put together the elements they had negotiated without America and have a separate agreement? If it's the economy, economic factors that's a driving force, what's going to happen now that TPP no longer exists? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, sir, I think, I think uh, most of what you said I totally agree with, but I would just add a nuance in the assumption you made or the characterization of TPP as being a sort of, you know, security mechanism. You know, as it is, the pivot to Asia, as President Obama had called it, was already moving forward with using stronger security commitments to reinforce alliances, right? The TPP was actually meant to be an economic complement to that, to show that America's presence in the Western Pacific was not just about geopolitics, but was also about the next generation of economics and trade liberalization, and helping American exporters uh, re maintain and increase their market share in Asia, and allowing Asians that have become quite dependent on exports to China to increase their access to the U.S. market. That was the intent, to have this really two-pillared approach. Now, neither is particularly strong at the moment. It's not only that TPP uh, is no longer on the U.S. agenda, it's also that in terms of security, you have a lot of tension in the bilateral relationships, even with Japan, even with South Korea. Look at the THAAD missile defense system. Look at the Philippines, where Duterte uh, is taking a very different approach than previous Philippine governments. So both pillars of U.S. engagement in the Far East are very, very wobbly. There's also one very, very important thing to, to, to mention, which is um, the fact that Asian economies that were participating in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations were not putting all their eggs in that basket. All of them, without a single exception, every single Asian country was also simultaneously part of the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific negotiations and the regional comprehensive economic partnership negotiations, both of which were, of course, pan-Asian focused. So at no point were they saying, um, if we have TPP with the United States, this will help protect us from China. Because the truth is, what all countries do in trade negotiations, if they're smart, is that they're playing all sides at the same time. And the evidence of that is that even though you don't hear anything about TPP anymore in Washington, every single other country is still negotiating TPP with each other. And so they got together just uh, one month after Trump's inauguration in Chile, for example. And China decided to come as an observer because the US wasn't going to be there. So the ultimate irony for us to all bear in mind is that the TPP agreement, which was pushed strongly by the US as a way, in your own words, sir, to, to sort of, you know, help to 
contain or to, or to prevent Chinese dominance, has become a trade agreement that everyone is participating in except America, and now China has decided to come in to America's agreement. The moral of the story is that you have to be part of these systems and arrangements if you ever want to influence countries. You cannot back away from them. So the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and One Belt, One Road are also great examples of the same thing because at the same time, you had the US trying to convince uh, European governments not to join AIIB, right? And to not participate in this Chinese-led infrastructure uh, uh, constellation. But of course, they all did. And now the US is on the sidelines of that as well, which is why you have people in Washington finally saying, you know what, we should actually join AIB. We should send a delegation, and they did send a small delegation to the Belt and Road Summit in Beijing. You have to be part of the game. You have to be present in the region. And we, you know, in America, we have no one to blame but ourselves, right? No one to blame but, but Congress. And the inability to sell what should have been an obvious no-brainer of a trade, pa a trade agreement uh, to the US public, when of course it would have increased exports to a fast-growing region, and yet the narrative got hijacked. We certainly can't blame China for that. America has to blame itself and take responsibility for shutting itself out of what is a, a huge growth story. Governor, your thoughts on TPP? Yeah, I think that uh, what we uh, see now, let's say, fr from this place, is, uh, it's, uh, from one point of view, it looks like the new administration is destroying the legacy of the previous administration. It's not only the TPP, but also the Paris Agreement. Uh, but I think that uh, what is going on, uh, the new administration is trying to kind of maximize the profit from any kind of the trade relationship, uh, cho choosing the strategy to do it uh, from, uh, f from uh, let's say, on bilateral base. So from, it's, we've seen the meetings of the leaders between U.S. and China, and the meetings with uh, of the new president uh, with the uh, community of the Islamic countries. So it's like the trying to figure out what can be done more pragmatic way or more kind of a business uh, driven way. And in this terms, I think the, anyway, the, the United States will come back to this kind of a global agenda, but later on with kind of a new principles. But at the same time, what is going on now, what we've seen is like uh, the U.S. is a kind of the biggest economy and number two is China. Is China trying to bring uh, themselves to the kind of international uh, Arin, in terms of the playing more proactive role in globalization. It was the first statement in World Economic Forum January this year by the President Xi. And also the global summit of One Belt, One Road in Beijing is actually shows that the China wants to be leader of the, and champion in globalization and champion in terms uh, of the not to be uh, very much uh, uh, pro, uh, to bring kind of the protectionism like a part of the economic policy. So in these terms, I think this also can be simplify life of all the uh, uh, Asian economies. It brings us to a good point. How does the change in leadership in Washington affect this Asian economic miracle, and will it continue, Governor? Yeah, I think that uh, the China definitely now is more. So it's kind of the also uh, dilemma for China. From one side, uh, they have to, because of there was a slowdown in the economy, they have to switch from the uh, export orientation to the more kind of the internal uh, demand-driven economy. So in these terms, I think the China uh, very well uh, use the kind of the opportunities of the big, ma big local market that we have is 1.4 billion people. And what we've seen now is kind of also paradigm shifting in the global economy. When the global economy moved to the new technologies, which is like uh, already was mentioned, like robotization or e-commerce, or let's say the, all, the, uh, uh, all the services uh, driven by the development of the internet. And we know all of these companies like in China, which is a global leaders like Alibaba, like Tencent. And when you have a kind of the opportunity to create any kind of a company, which is a local company in China, has access to the market, which is a 1.4 billion people. And I think that this is really very promising. I think in the future, what is kind of the, uh, uh, what is the kind of great opportunities to grow if you have a really kind of the big markets and demographic trends have a market in China, have access to the market in as a 4 billion people in Asia is a kind of the great opportunities to grow for China. And I think the China will compete with uh, 
uh, U.S. and European economy for the global leadership. We have just 15 minutes left. I want to turn now to our audience uh, to get a question from uh, the people who are here uh, listening uh, today. Make your question, uh, or get to your question very quickly, please, uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, my name is Malo Gigan. I'm a, a student in Montreal, Canada. So you were talking about um, Chinese growth and how it might be slowing down and what we could do to, uh, to continue it. Now, what I see from the outside is uh, the, the problem with, with foreigners who are having a tough time creating, uh, working in China, creating a business, being entrepreneurs, uh, me, uh, myself included in, in this interest. And, uh, for now, the Chinese government is, is all for innovation and development, but for their own. But I think there's a, there's a huge potential and huge market for uh, foreigners, young students, uh, young entrepreneurs who want to, to create something in China. Do you think uh, the Chinese government is going to, in the next few years, change or reform their policies to be able to, uh, to encourage this? Because I, w with more foreigners moving to China, uh, the, the, the market potential and the growth is, is going to amplify more than in, in Europe, where, where the entrepreneurship uh, possibilities are, are a lot less. Thank you. I believe that uh, the, in China, uh, one of the, by the way, ingredients which I would like to, to add to the previous uh, remarks is that is, uh, they have, a, even they've been criticized that in terms of the rate of uh, uh, democratization of the country. They have very, uh, very uh, good meritocracy system. So they have very smart and efficient central and local governments. And I think this, uh, which based on very pragmatic way to bring best practice and to create good opportunities to do business in China. So I believe that this country uh, uh, would be open for, so they, they realize that they will get more benefits to be more open to the rest of the world. So in these terms, uh, to do business in China is a very promising area. I don't see that any kind of the, uh, it's, it's not easy. There is a, some kind of the rules of this market to get access. So you have to kind of follow certain, uh, certain rules. But I think that it's a great opportunity. From the other side, I, I'm kind of the representing the government of uh, Kazakhstan here. So I think that is also to do business in China is a great opportunity to to do it also from Kazakhstan. We are kind of, we have a 2,000 kilometers common border with China, and we believe that we are really kind of a good uh, gateway to, to do business in the western part of China. And uh, so more kind of information about western part of China. So we know that all the eastern part of China is very well developed. So, and for example, uh, so in some places in China, for example, in, uh, in Suzhou, which is the closest city to Shanghai, they have the GDP per capita is with like a more than 20, 23,000 uh, uh, per capita. But the uh, western part of China is not well developed. And now they have a program which is, uh, which they call uh, uh, Go West in order to develop this part of, uh, and I think that it will be kind of huge investment from the central government to this place. And I think that we have all have the great opportunities to also to get kind of the indirect benefits on this. Governor, talk is cheap and money talks. Uh, I want you and Parag and our, our other panelists to make the case, why should investors believe in this miracle? Why should they put their money here? Yeah, I think, uh, so first of all, uh, any kind of investor uh, thinking about uh, kind of two main dimensions. So first of all, how to save the, the investment, and I think that here is important the kind of rule of law, uh, uh, many kind of the guarantees to the investors, and I think that there is a kind of track records of the Asian markets that is kind of a good place to invest, and the second is definitely to make money, and it's a kind of very promising, very gr uh, fast growing market, and this is kind of uh, very good opportunities, and I believe that uh, this uh, growing market is a kind of a good, perp uh, good uh, place uh, for any kind of investors or institutional investors to come. Yeah, but look at what happened in South Korea. If you're an investor and you think about what happened there uh, politically and within Samsung, uh, Parag, how do, you, how do you overcome this? Well, you know, of course there are, and I think Ayuna already 
answered this in terms of the things that South Korea knows that it does have to do. Uh, and, and what's going to motivate them is not just, uh, obviously, you know, internal uh, sort of dynamics, because they, there you can have a, you can fall back into complacency. What's happening to South Korea is what they did to Japan, which is because, which, which is happening though from China. China is displacing key South Korean leadership and sectors the way I, I South think, Korea did Specifically, to, to, I mean yeah. the message, not, not for South Korea, but I mean to investors, people who were pouring money into South Korea, investing in Samsung, believing in the system in South Korea. How do you now fix this? this is, it's a brand reputation problem, isn't it? Oh, sure, but of course, again, we're, investors globally are still looking for high-tech companies, those with good access and exposure to the growth markets. And if you look at the efforts that Korean companies are making through their investments in new technologies, e-commerce, social media, apps like Line and others that are, or gaming companies out of South Korea that now have huge penetration in China, there is there are plenty of growth stories there. Uh, let's not forget, we can't boil down such a sophisticated economy as Korea to just Samsung. And let's bear in mind, as we sit here, this is the 20th anniversary of the Asian financial crisis. Now, when the Asian financial crisis struck, governments, regulators, central banks, finance ministries stuck their heads in the sand. Now look 20 years later at these same countries that were affected by that crisis. Look at their savings rates, look at their reserves, look at their growth rates, look at their incomes. Right? There, there, it's nothing like what it was 20 years ago. And to add to the, the very strong cushion, the fact that these countries have maintained strong growth despite the financial crisis that hit a decade ago, with all of those tailwinds that they still have, all of that momentum they still have, I want to add one factor that uh, the chairman is working very hard on, and that's privatization. Because there's a seriousness in the next five years, all immediately that you already see, from this whole Asian region, which I, in which I include Saudi Arabia, all the way to Vietnam, uh, for pretty significant privatization in very major industries. And that is going to attract a lot of attention, and is attracting a lot of attention from all of the world's uh, major asset managers, pension funds, private wealth, uh, insurance companies, banks, and so forth. Everyone is already looking at the major privatization opportunities that are going to accelerate in the next five years as governments want to uh, stay fiscally sound, want to raise capital, want to bring in new talent, new management, want to diversify industries, want to be competitive. What government in Asia is not saying right now that they want to do all those things and that privatization is going to be a key part of the strategy. They're not only saying it, they're doing it. So like you said, talk is cheap, that there's action, there's traction, and the money is going to chase that. Quick comment from the governor, and then we're going to turn back to the audience for a question. Yeah, I would like just to emphasize uh, two more uh, issues. Is one is the, uh, two more dimensions. One is uh, like uh, smart regulation. So I believe that, uh, for example, in Singapore, having the such authorities like monetary authorities of Singapore, who are more uh, pro development authorities, is not just like to kind of be, be very strict uh, regulation, very, very strict and very prudent, but at the same time more focus on development, for example, like development of the fintech or any kind of new technology. And the other dimension, which is more, uh, very much important, is uh, uh, human capital. So what we've seen is that the Asian countries heavily invest to the human capital to create new generation of these, uh, let's say, of the, uh, of the people of these countries. Let's see what happened like the recently the universities like uh, Tsinghua University of University of Singapore uh, joined to be like a top 20 global universities, which is uh, not a, wasn't the case like 20 years ago. So I believe that this kind of the very uh, smart new generation also attract new investors to come. Thank you. Now let's turn to our audience. There's a question uh, behind me here. Go ahead. Blockchain on the behalf. I would like to, the panel to address the issue of the future uh, economic miracle that is happening today. I think we all heard mostly about the centralized or up-down approach that is still dominate, dominating the, the minds and also the uh, all the governments and uh, uh, the countries. However, there is a big trend that is happening now that uh, brings power to people to people economy. So what is your view on the future, whether you believe this is happening, when it is going to happen, and whether Asia is prepared to this? 
Go ahead, Governor. Yeah, I think that uh, the overall view in terms of the Asian economies, uh, economies, but not only Asian, let's take a Germany, is also was moving from the state-driven uh, capitalism to the uh, market economy. So, and we've seen a case of Japan, of South Korea, uh, China, Singapore, it was dominated by the government on the early stage, but then it was like a real kind of uh, uh, public-private uh, partnership. In terms of the people to people, I believe that this is the future of the global economy. So all of this, what we see, for example, in the financial services, we have a lot of uh, businesses which we call like peer to peer. So the people uh, nowadays uh, want to talk to each other rather than to use any kind of intermediary institutions. So I believe that the, it will be new landscape of, it, for example, financial services, like uh, so we will not see the the banking industry, uh, industry uh, which we've seen now. So we've seen like now, so a lot of the uh, internet driven uh, services uh, more kind of bring us to the more uh, deeper financial inclusion globally. So we see like a revolution in financial um, inclusion in China or let's say in Eastern Africa, in Kenya, so when we kind of the new technologies allow to create absolutely new services to the people and kind of the new reality of the global economy. So we believe, so this is the future. In Kazakhstan, uh, we also driven by the uh, excitement of the post-industrial re uh, revolution and excitement in, uh, in the new financial services. We also want to leapfrog. We, we, we didn't invest heavily to the, in previous uh, 30 years, like we, for example, Europe invest to infrastructure previous 100 years. And now we believe that we can really kind of get the uh, benefits from this. One of these delivery units is the uh, Astana International Financial Services uh, uh, team, which we would like really to leapfrog to be uh, the completely new uh, financial services hub based on the new technologies. And we want to help you leapfrog. Thank you. <laughs> uh, finally, we, we only have about three minutes left, so I want to wrap things up with uh, some quick comments, or there's a question here. In the, in the audience. Uh, do we have time for uh, one last question? Okay, one last Thank question, but make it very, very quick. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Shahid Qureshi. I'm from London. I'm the editor of London Post. Uh, the British experience of privatization is, is uh, really, really uh, kind of uh, collapsing uh, according to the new statistics. Uh, for example, in the health sector, we found uh, that the uh, private companies do want to come in, but their investment into human resources is almost zero. It's, so it's more of a profit making. Uh, we had Naylor report, which is talking about the selling of the NHS uh, assets to the private uh, developers with the money from the taken from the public banks. So there are a lot of issues in terms of privatization. Privatization seems very attractive, but when it comes to the investment into the human resources, we see the, 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 the people who are trained by the taxpayers' money are used by the private sectors for their profit-making uh, machine or profit-making making system. So are you uh, available, are you sure that, that you want to follow the British uh, way of privatization, uh, which is already, uh, Jeremy Corbyn has said that he's going to uh, take the bank should be public owned and uh, so is the British Rail should be public owned because we have seen the companies, they were making profit, but they're not any doing uh, public service. Thank you. Uh, so I think that uh, after the, let's say, the 40 years of the, when we uh, just to study any kind of the successful cases or non-successful cases, so the, I think the, the British uh, experts themselves divided for kind of the uh, positive side and also the downsides of the privatization. So they understand that some companies was privatized very well, especially when the kind of the feedback of the privatization was when the people of, uh, of this country actually be part of the entire processes. It was a very transparent process, and then they kind of provide opportunities for, for all the people be shareholders and get a feeling that they are shareholders of the assets of the country. So in these terms, it was a real kind of investment to the, uh, to the country. But in some cases, it was failed because uh, uh, so let's say later on the market wasn't structured very well and uh, so we kind of it was uh, like kind of a review on uh, what happened. 
But uh, in general, I think the, the British privatization is a kind of the benchmark that the country should move more to the economy which was driven by the private sector. Nowadays, I think that from one side, the privatization, I mentioned that it's a part of the 100 uh, steps program in Kazakhstan, is, uh, should be definitely the key part of the reforms because we have an economy where more than 60 percent is driven by the uh, quasi-government sector and we want to bring the, uh, the global investors, not because of the budget needs, but because of the a lack of a good corporate governance here. So what we need is that we need investors, true investors, in order to come and really to help us to develop the corporate governance. From the other side, we remember that the feedback from the early stage of privatization in the former Soviet Union countries wasn't really good in terms of the, uh, what is the kind of the plans of the government when the investors will come and it will be kind of a restructuring and the, some people will lose a job. So how are we going to prepare it for this? This is also very important issues. The privatization nowadays is, should be like a free, uh, 360 degrees to understand what is the kind of the good consequences, what is the kind of the uh, challenges, and how we should uh, resolve it. Just one more comment. Uh, I think so the last 30 years, China gave the very good exam example for the privatization either through government uh, uh, pri uh, the uh, management buyout or to uh, purely privatized the assets. That is one foundation for China booming. Yeah. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, but uh, special thanks to uh, the governor, uh, His Excellency Mr. Kairat Kelambetov, Mr. Parag Hanna, um, Ariuna Namsra, and Wang Wei. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for attending. Uh, this talk on the Asian economic miracle.